So when you have a contribution, it's really important that you explain what you do. Uh, it's actually the most important communication that you have toward the upstream. It's also what sticks in the comic blocks. I recommend that you always have a link to either the blueprint, that is the specifications of uh, related to the patch that you're doing, or a link to the bug report to which uh, you, you are referring or which you are fixing. So it so happens that Redmine used by Seth uh, also interprets the comments. And if you add refs, hash, the bug number in the commit, it will uh, show in the Redmine tracker next to the comments related to the ticket. So you will in actually integrate the commit once it's accepted in the ticket, which is also so nice. However, when you do that, uh, you don't actually specify the URL. So when the commit shows on GitHub, the hash something will not link. And it, so you will have to copy past the number and go to the tracker, which is inconvenient. So in the case of Seth, what I tend to do is also add the U full URL of the link. Um, then about the comment itself, uh, you need to choose a title. Uh, it's as difficult as choosing the title of a book because the too long didn't read uh, reader will want to understand everything from the title. So in the title, you must say exactly what the bug does. And if it's the only thing that the upstream is going to read, you would say, if I was an upstream, I would accept this bug just by the title. It never happens. But uh, So I, uh, what I usually do is I, uh, I try two or three times to come up with a proper title for the comment. It's, it can be a burden when the uh, fix is actually small, but it matters. And then in the comment, uh, the key for explaining is to not talk about wh uh, what you did, but to why you did it. So you just uh, avoid saying, I did that, but you fix yourself on saying, why did I do that? Unless the patch is very trivial, you had to make choices. You had to make choices about things that could be done in different ways. And you have to explain why you chose this path rather than the other. Um, then, for every uh, free software project that is well known and widely spread, which is the case of Ceph, you have a stable branch and you have the development branch. When you code, you always code on the development branch. It's not a good rule to code uh, on the stable branch. Even if what you're trying to do is to fix a bug that exists in the stable branch. I'm not talking about the bugs that only exist in the stable branch, but a bug that uh, is in the software and also happens in, uh, in the stable branch you will work on the trunk, on the development branch, to fix it. But then, you will have to backport it. So the usual process, I fix it on the dev branch, then I backport it. If you try to think about backporting your change from the beginning, you may find a way to backport it without any change. And when you do that, uh, you make yourself a favor and you also help the stable branch maintainer. Because uh, it's the case uh, mostly uh, in OpenStack, there is this rule that if a bug can be cherry picked from the development branch, it will go, a bug fix, I mean, can be cherry picked from the development branch 
into the stable branch, it will go in the next stable release without uh, a need for uh, a review that is as careful as if it was completely different code. Because the guy who maintains the stable branch already knows this fix works. So he just has to think about the impact of the bug in the stable branch, but he does not have to think about how to modify the code in order to backport it. Now, of course, uh, we do not leave upstream. We are contributors. So we always have a local branch, and uh, that is different from the branch that is upstream. In the case where we only work on the development branch, uh, it's fairly easy. To, uh, the, the work is easy because you upstream your work and when you don't upstream it uh, immediately uh, you can fairly easily uh, rebase it. So let me give you an example. Uh, last week I uh, submitted a code that is a very big change to the pg.cc uh, and .h uh, in CEF. It's 7,000 lines long. Of course, it's not going to be accepted right away. It's not even ready for review. But I'm in the situation where I have a local change and the, uh, the code is still moving. So in order to handle that uh, on a daily basis, I rebase the patch so that it remains current in the development branch. And the more time passes, the more uh, rebase I will do. So I have a big incentive to uh, reduce this gap between my in-house version and the development branch. Uh, that's why I uh, try to get directions from Sam and Sage about how to go with this patch. Is it uh, going in the right direction in order to conclude as fast as possible? Because every day I have to rebase. So this is a very small example, but it can grow very large. For instance, in the OpenStack context, um, HP in the OpenStack Diablo uh, release decided to use this release to uh, run HP Cloud. And they did a fork, an uh, in-house version. And so they, they have this burden uh, times 1,000 because they are in a branch that diverge from the trunk significantly and they have a lot of trouble reconciling. The good workflow is therefore this one where you have uh, the stable version here that evolves and you use this version let's say and when you find a bug you go to the trunk that is the development version you do your bug fix and then you backport and as I said earlier, if you're good, you will make a patch that fits both the trunk and the stable version. However, most of the time what happens is this, that is, you have an internal version that is based on the latest stable, that is a fork. You have missed the upgrade of the latest stable version that you should have merged with your own, but you didn't. And the development happens here, which makes it very difficult for you to patch. So as I said, you cannot avoid that bad workflow. You can only work on controlling it. You don't want to be in the situation of HP with HP Cloud and Diablo. Uh, but uh, as I described, uh, even if I'm careful and I do a rebase every day, I'm in the situation where I have an in-house version. You have to put yourself uh, in a situation where you, you constantly measure how far away you are from the upstream and when you will decide that it's too much. So the, the trick is to think about it and say, okay, I'm good because I have this amount of delta. The example uh, I have is when um, 
uh, I was working with François Charlier uh, on the Puppet uh, modules for OpenStack. Uh, it was very much in the making, and we decided that if we were more than two weeks behind the trunk, then all work would stop, and we would only make sure that we reconcile with the upstream. My golden rule, maybe wrong, but that's what I have in mind, is that for one day where you diverge from upstream, it will take you another day to reconverge. And the more you wait, it's not actually true because it tends to be exponential, but even that. So if two weeks without reconciling takes you two weeks to, of work to be upstream again, so let, imagine if you let slide two months, what employer will give you two months to reconcile with the upstream? So it should be done uh, on a very small time frame so that it's completely transparent to uh, your development workflow. If it so happens that constantly you are in a state where you diverge too much, so you always hit your limit, and it's always a burden, it may be a sign that you picked the wrong free software project to do what you do. That you're trying to fit into a free software project something that is not in its goal. You're trying to make it something else. And maybe, indeed, you should fork. You should create another project. Or maybe switch project. Or maybe you have problems uh, reconciling a string. But you, uh, you have to be conscious of the fact that there may be legitimate reasons, good reasons, why you cannot uh, sustain reconciling all the time. When it comes to uh, having your patches accepted, uh, that is to make sure that you are as efficient as possible to get your patches upstream, it's not just technical. It's mostly uh, soft skills. So that's where getting to know the people will help you. You will have to do some diplomacy, which is a uh, bad word to say that you will try to manipulate people. But it's not really. It's just figuring out what is the best path you have your um, patch upstream. We are not diplomats, we are developers. We are not used to this exercise. And most of the time when we hear about diplomacy, it's about tricking people into doing something they don't want to do. And figuring out how to do a diplomacy in a good way uh, is not natural to us. I don't know exactly how to explain. Everybody has to draw the line. And if you sense that you become too manipulative, that you, uh, you don't feel comfortable doing what you do because you want your patch accepted, then better don't do it. So I will give you an example. Uh, we, uh, in Upstream University, we trained a kernel developer from a company uh, that I will not name. Uh, came from um, uh, making uh, patches to the kernel for a proprietary vendor. So he knew the kernel very well, but he didn't know anything about the free software process. So he was used to work in-house for kernel development and had to learn his way into the Linux kernel community, which is uh, a very peculiar community. And when it came to diplomacy, which is often the case with uh, uh, Linux kernel development because uh, it's it's not the most friendly community there is. Uh, he just refused. And at first it struck me as uh, he was not cooperative. But what he said is, I will not play these games. I will not try to ease my way into having the upstream accept my contribution by doing the tricks you suggest. And the trick I suggested was a very simple one. I told him, okay, you're stuck with the contribution. And 
you waiting for a review, but it does not happen. Will you do just something else? Or will you rather uh, participate in the project to increase your karma so that maybe um, the person who will review your patch will be more inclined to do it today rather than in a week from now because he, uh, he will know that you need him and you have helped him. So maybe choose a, a bug that he recently opened and work on it. And for him it was manipulated. It was, uh, and it is in a way. I mean, uh, it's fairly transparent to any upstream that while you sit waiting for a review, uh, you increase your karma by fixing bugs uh, that are around you. So uh, you, you do good just waiting. So you're not just selfishly interested in what matters to you, but you also care uh, when you have nothing better to do about what other people do. So you can see how he, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe it is manipulative, but maybe you don't want to do that. He didn't do that. In the end, his patch was accepted, maybe longer, uh, so, but he drew the line. He paid the price, uh, which is fairly light. That is, he was uh, proud of himself for not manipulating anyone. And the price he had to pay is to just wait patiently longer, which is perfectly fine. In my opinion, it, also, it is also okay to, uh, to do karma missions while waiting, in the hope that uh, it will help the review. But some people may have different ideas. So diplomacy is kind of a tricky business. And, uh, we're not very good at it, so, uh, and it's all about getting attention, of course. When you uh, to speed the acceptance, uh, there are hundreds of topics the upstream is dealing with. Why should he deal with your review first rather than the other? The the time frame when you do that is also very important. So as an upstream, uh, it's kind of obvious, but as a contributor, it's less obvious. When you see someone every day, uh, you tend to think that he is part of the project. And in the context of a free software project, seeing someone is either reading a mail from the mailing list or uh, seeing a message on RRC or having a pull request being sent. And Ceph is no different than any other project. If you don't see anyone, if, if you're a contributor and you just quietly work uh, on your computer for two weeks, uh, literally it's like you were on vacation. Nobody will, will notice. There is a funny thing, and I suggest you try that with people you know. You take a patch that took you two weeks to write, intense two weeks, or even a month, and you tell someone who is a developer, took me a day to work on this patch. Let's say if it, if it was two weeks, you say it took me a day. And see how many of them will tell you, uh, no way, took, we, took you at least 10 days. It's extremely rare. People do not value the work they see and they can very rarely match it to the time you spent on it. So by all means, when you submit a patch from the point of view of the upstream, it could have been a one-day work, even if it was two weeks. So when someone rejects the patch, Let's say an upstream reject the patch. He says uh, it, it's not in the, uh, it's not going in the, in the direction it should go. If he thinks that it's a one day, uh, uh, it's worth one day of your time, he will uh, maybe carelessly reject it, and you will be very upset because you have spent two weeks working in vain because you were in the wrong direction. So maybe you will smash your head against the table and say, oh, I should have 
coconut, pearl ear, etc. But it, or maybe you, you would say, well, he should value my work more. But the truth is, for him, it's probably just one day work. So what, what's the big deal? He, how can he know? Now, if you have engaged daily, just casually speaking about the fact that you were working, uh, scratching your head about this convention while working on this bug, and updating the ticket to log, which I do, uh, in Redmine for Ceph, you can log the hours you spend on a, on a project, on a, on a ticket. So what I do is at the end of the day, or maybe every other day, I log, okay, I spent five hours working on this. And all these signs shows the upstream that you've worked on that. And if, I, if I'm an upstream, and I have a contributor who is uh, showing you a lot of goodwill, he submits the same patch, but there has been signs that he was working on it. And I get to reject it. Maybe I will, uh, I will uh, spare his feelings and say, well, I'm very sorry, uh, but you were completely in the wrong direction. I should have paid attention. And, but this is not the way it should be done. And then you will, you will feel sorry for you, and you, you will still smash your head against the table because you did not ask earlier, but it will feel a lot better. So the time frame sh when you, you show the work you're done matters a lot. Also, when you try to get attention from the upstream because it's time for review, uh, it's often the case that you have to ask more than once. So it all depends on the workload of the upstream, which is something in the good free software project such as Ceph you can easily guess by seeing the commits and the message from the upstream. If you see 20 messages a day and 50 commits a day, say, oh, I is extremely busy, probably not ready to review my patch. And also there is a release coming, so it's not a good time to ask for attention. But if you have submitted a patch the way you should, that is, for instance, sending a mail to the mailing list, uh, my recommendation is after a week, if nothing happens, it's probably because it was overlooked. And so you should try to ping someone and say, uh, would you like to review? In the context of Ceph, for instance, it could be that you go to IRC and you say, uh, is there anyone willing to review my patch? Not necessarily the upstream. Any, anyone. So uh, what you did uh, is, for instance, someone, uh, sometimes you, you ask me to review your patch, although I don't know much about it. Uh, but if I get something to say, uh, then it may help and uh, relieve some of the work from the upstream. In the end, in a well-behaved project, I have never seen the need to ask for attention more than four times. Can you imagine that someone, let's say you are the upstream, someone submits a patch, you see it pass, you're very busy, you let it slide. Then you see that the same guy asks for a review a week after that to random people, you say, oh, I should review, but it's not the time. So I will wait for someone else to review, but, so we caught your attention another time. Then a week after that, the same guy says, uh, when do you think you will have time to review my patch? Because, uh, well, I have rebased it, uh, it went fine, but, um, well, uh, I would like to know. Uh, then maybe you will decide that uh, it's time because it has been two weeks. Maybe it's uh, it's marginal bug or a uh, unit test that would be nice to be here, but not critical. Uh, so you will spare the 10 minutes of your time to do that. And if you ask a fourth time, then it's kind of obvious from the upstream point of view that you have been neglected as a contributor one way or the other. No contributor should have to ask four times. So as an upstream, uh, you, I suspect that you will feel uh, yourself forced to review, to act on that after the fourth time. Otherwise, you will face the fact that there is something broken in the relationship with the contributor if he has to ask four times over four weeks. 
and maybe you will apologize, which happens uh, fairly often when uh, reviews get delayed uh, a long time. So here, as a contributor, the time frame to get attention also matters because if you nag the upstream too much, then it will not feel uh, guilty about neglecting your contribution. You will feel pissed because you want attention like a small child asking, ah, will you my patch, please, will you my patch? Actually, I, I felt like that about two days ago about my big patch, uh, which I'm very worried about. Uh, I think I asked too much attention from Sage. Uh, and, but I could not refrain from it. Uh, so instead of continuing in this direction, then I chose to do some uh, other work. But I felt that uh, I was uh, too pushy. Sage was kind enough to uh, not tell me that, uh, but I, I, I could see that he was busy. I shouldn't have done that. But as, a, as an upstream or as a contributor, you're also expecting, uh, expected to do mistakes some of the time. So you're not expected to be completely perfect. Uh, that's a mistake I did in the time frame. It was too soon. Oh, about the uh, time frame thing also. You have to be, uh, and that's uh, a problem I think you have. You have to be uh, careful not to let too much time pass uh, and maybe force yourself into uh, asking for attention. Then I mentioned it um, a number of times. Uh, when you don't have anything better to do, you build your karma. And there are so many easy ways to build your karma. In the case of erasure coding, which is a difficult contribution, uh, asks a lot of uh, imagination, and uh, I'm pretty much swimming in, uh, uh, I'm out of my depth in that, and trying to not draw. So the karma missions are actually a relief. It's kind of, that's so easy to fix a bug, and be on shallow waters with, where problems are simple, so it's, uh, I should mention that in the slide, that uh, it's not only uh, to build karma, but also when you are in a difficult spot, it's also a way to feel good about yourself. Uh, I certainly feel good about myself for having two uh, comments accepted uh, last night. And when that happens, the big problems uh, just do not seem so scary anymore. So I, uh, it could be fixing the website, fixing the documentation, even asking, uh, answering questions that are asked by people on IRC, which I also did yesterday. Uh, and of course, you're, uh, there is no fourth sequence in doing all that. Uh, it can be done all in parallel. Typically, three topics, the work, the karma missions, and learning about the project. In a project that is as big as self, uh, there is always something new to learn. So, for instance, uh, yesterday I tried to review a patch uh, to add uh, RBD, um, RBD map at boot time. So, a script that goes in init and that will, from our RBD map, that would map the RBD device that are supposed to be mapped before they can be mounted. Uh, so I, uh, I tried to do that, and while doing that, I had to discover uh, the init process of Ceph and see how it's done, and think about it, think about the links about LVM. So I, I got to explore uh, new uh, ways. So it was a karma mission, and it, but it also uh, helped me learn more about the project. And maybe it will help also with the core of the work at some point. But uh, it's all uh, done in parallel and not in sequence. We've covered pretty much everything I had to say about the contribution process. So 
here we, we have all uh, the chronological and so, uh, dimensions and sociological dimensions, psychological dimensions related to uh, contribution. And it goes, uh, it applies to the easy contributions but also to the most difficult contributions. I sorted them from the easier contribution to the most difficult here where answering questions on RFC is really easy. Uh, some people come and say, okay, uh, is Ceph uh, a storage system? You can say yes, and that's done. But it's not actually the, uh, ups the first level of upstream contribution um, that you can do because it does not require the upstream to accept your work. It's like a wiki contribution. Contributing code and documentation to a free software project requires that the upstream accepts in his repository your code. And so this is the first level uh, of difficulty. Then the second level of difficulty is to uh, get specifications, blueprint accepted by the upstream. That can be tremendously difficult. Uh, in, for example, uh, going back to erasure coding, uh, the way it happened, and the way it should probably happen all the time in all the free software project, is that it was driven by the need of a user. So a user came and said, I have a massive amount of genomic data to store, and three replicates is not good for me. I, I want to use Ceph, but I also need erasure coding. So here, there was a user, a use case. He also said, I have this use case, I have this need, uh, that's worth a blueprint. So he wrote it in the context of the first Ceph summit, but he also said, I have no coding uh, people to implement that. So I contribute this use case, which is fairly clear, and he went in a lot of details, even suggesting a path implement uh, for implementation, etc. And that's where I, I got to step in and say, okay, I will code that. Not out of the kindness of my heart, but also because I knew that my employer had the same need. So that's the birth of the blueprint, and it can be born in many ways. It had then to be accepted upstream. A blueprint in a free software project is accepted because you work on it. But then the upstream does not really have a say, because if it's your time, you can do whatever you want. In order to, for a blueprint to be accepted, the upstream has to say, has to commit something which was not the case for the erasure coding blueprint. So uh, Christopher submitted uh, uh, the blueprint. I committed to spend time on it. And the upstream was uh, happy to provide guidance, but did not commit to anything more than guidance. So uh, Ink Tank uh, committed to provide guidance. That was kind of an acceptance, because guidance from them is very valuable, and it helps a lot. Although they were not fully committed, it was kind of being accepted, blueprint being accepted upstream. But here you can see that it's very blurry. In the case of OpenStack, it's much clearer, because you have the blueprints that are scheduled, marked, scheduled for this uh, release. So, in, in any case, uh, what time is it? I think... Uh, <coughs> 12. It's quite 12. Mm. Okay. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah